Uh, so we are going to be covering chapter three of the GGplot2 book. Uh, for this chapter, we are, we are introducing what is called layers. Uh, that's basically how we will be constructing our GGplot2 object uh, one manner at a time. So the purpose of these layers is going to be whether to display data or perhaps a statistical summary, a statistical summary of it, uh, and two of those, uh, sorry, and both of those purposes, we're going to cover them in this particular chapter. But there is also another purpose, and that is to add metadata. And that is just context information about geographic. So it can be something like an annotation or perhaps some references. At least for each chapter, uh, such metadata will not be explored. So what we will be covering is individual geoms. There is some basic plot types that we can, that we can use in ggplot2. They are like building blocks of this package. And they are also going to, to, to be the basis upon other types of geoms, of course, more complex ones. Uh, those are going to be constructed. For example, the histogram geom or the violin geom. And we are going to take a look at those and, and well in the last part in one of the later exercises. Now, this type of basic plot types, well, they most of them are associated with specific name. And um, they these, well, these are functions, so they also have some arguments. And all of them that we're going to cover today, they accept these arguments for the x, x the x-axis, the y-axis, and some type of color to make a differentiation. Probably between some groups, or maybe there is some categorical vari variable in your data, and you want to show some difference via this color argument. Uh, and in that same fashion, we, we also have the fill argument uh, for some particular genes. And it also serves as a way to differentiate uh, your data via grouping it uh, via some categorical variable in your data. So to start, uh, uh, well, th these notes are based on the, on the ones from the previous cohort, but uh, I changed a little bit the order so that if there is, for example, some type of plot as we can see over here, it says area plot. If this plot is using a specific plot type, then we are going to cover such a specific plot type before. So it's like we are building from basic to most so to more complex. Well, in that fashion, we could have started with a scatter plot, but I prefer to start with the line plot because it's a there's a connection with the area plot. So if we have been working with some data sets, we, we should be familiar with the economics data sets, with the cars data set, also with the MPG one or, or diamonds. They are really popular. And in this case, we're constructing a graphic of this economics data set. And in the x-axis, we're uh, putting in the date. And for the y-axis, we're, we're calculating some numerical value. And the idea is that if you are working with, a, sorry, if you're working with some time dependent data, so for example, like a time series, well, these line plots are pretty useful. We simply activate them or show them via, via this command. And this is the output. It's pretty much what we would expect from a time series. Now, this, this line plot, uh, it's also a building block for, what is going to be the area plot. In particular, this area plot is going to draw a line plot, but it's going to fill it uh, with respect to the y-axis. I think it's also, it's also possible to change this, this orientation uh, for which axis it's filling, not only the y-axis, also the x-axis. Um, I think that's how violin uh, geons are constructed. We will, we will look at that in the future episodes. So for this example, I'm going to be using uh, the Gaussian distribution or normal distribution. I will simply set some interval uh, that it is part of the domain of such 
specific distribution and I am going to plot it. So in the X values, I have some particular domain for that function. And in the Y value, I'm going to plot the density function of the normal distribution. So what I wanted to show oh, for this area plot is what we're really accustomed to is that uh, how to detect and wait, now that I think about it, it's not the precise interval, what, what I'm going to show over here. Okay, but I'm going to, to find the first quartile of the associated to this to this specific distribution, the normal one, which means zero and standard deviation one. And also, well, the third quartile, but, but by symmetry, it's going to be a negative of the first one. So in this case, I'm simply going to use here on line to plot the, the graph of the density. It's a normal distribution as we have, as we are using over here for the Gaussian data frame. And the main idea is that I want to show over here the, the, the region that represents the area under this curve. There is a specific probability. In this case, what I am plotting over here is being done via this function, geom area. And as we can see, we can use another aesthetic mapping for this particular geom. And in this case, I am considering the x values that are greater than the first quartile, but smaller than the third quartile. Or that I should have changed uh, for, their, for those to be the, the limits so the, the limits that you use to define the player. So I, I had to add over here. Q1 plus, uh, I think it was 1.5, the interquartile range. And over here, and over here is minus seven. And for this one, the third quartile plus 1.5, the interquartile range. But, but it's okay. Uh, and now we are considering those values. So if it's if such x lines within this range, we consider it as the as the region that we are going to be shading. But if not, then we can put NA because we, we don't want to shade that specific region. In this case, we are shading the, the area for when X is greater than Q1, but smaller than Q3, and lies behind this specific curve. And we're, look, uh, we are doing over here. And we simply set a color parameter. So this represents 50% of the data or 50% of the total integral. Could you look over here? Now for a more basic one, uh, bar plot, uh, when you can use in, we use them to, to make some counting. So what's the number of occurrences in a certain category? And that's what we're doing over here. We have some data set and some quantitative, no sorry, qualitative or categorical variable of these data sets. So for each of the classes or groups in this categorical variable color, then we want to see how many occurrences there are per class. So we use this geom and over here we have the count for these specific classes, D, E, F, and such and such of the color categorical variable, we have over here the count, how many observations per class. And now there was a comment in the book, as we can see over here, that Ion bar requires the argument state, state equal identity. But whenever I use it uh, in these or other type of examples, it didn't work. Uh, did it work for you, Lokesh? Uh... No, so I actually was not able to try this. Oh. Okay, but well, so you're, you're saying the stat equal to identity option. So can you show like what happens here if you put stat equal to identity? Uh, let me see. Uh, well, I'm going to run it. Uh, let me open um, our terminal. So I simply want to execute this code. Ah, uh, well, I can paste it over here. So let me 
Colapon, the necessary by library, sorry, D plus two. And then execute this code via the parameter, sorry, with the parameter start equal identity for the on bar. Let's see. D plus diamonds, aesthetic color. And then we want the P on bar. Uh, for sorry. well, if I do this, it, it should work as we can see over here. But now that I add what the book proposes identity, but it didn't work for me. As we can see over here, there it says problem while setting up the um, it requires a Y aesthetic. So basically, so. This is set, so some Y column. But because it didn't work for me, I made a, a small change for this mm -hmm. part because I wanted to include some type of stat argument. So I did this. Yeah, let me. Oh, no, it's okay. Uh, it's in this part. Okay. So now I do include a Y variable. In this case, it's a numerical one, the price. And now we can do a, a sort of Grouping something like probably you are all accustomed to in the prior to use the uh, group by, then you group your data and and you do something right, and then you do a summary, pre group, yes, like this. And in that sense, it turns out that John Bar can also do all of that pretty sim pretty simply. So we have some categorical variable, some numerical one. So we can say, well, let's group by color and then execute some function for each of those classes. No, sorry, for each group, execute some function on this numerical variable. So we group by color uh, because you, we are specifying over here for you bar the stat summary bin. So we're grouping. And then what function do, what, do we want to use for this other variable, the one in the white? in the Y argument. In this case, simply the mean function. So basically what we are plotting over here is, what is the mean per color class of the price variable? And yeah, that's so, what, yes, sorry. So basically this is something similar to say, select uh, color uh, and then uh, average uh, average price uh, yes. and group by color, right? So this is the same as that. Yeah, like a uh, group by color and then average price, as you said. Average price, yeah. Okay, okay, great. So that's the summary bin. Okay, start equal to summary bin. Okay, now it's also a, a really basic uh, type of plot. This is a scatter plot, so we're simply showing the, a certain dependency between two numerical variables. For, for that, we use the MPG dataset, and that's what we get. And lastly, for the rectangle one, well, I did I did find a, a useful application of this one, but let, let's start with for what to sorry, with what this geom does. So we can construct a rectangle uh, via specifying its vertices, well, the coordinates of its vertices. So in this part, we I define the the four vertices. Of a, of a generic rectangle. So this is X1, the second X vertices, the sorry, the second X vertex, then so the first Y vertex, and then the second Y vertex. So each of these columns has two, two elements because I am going to be constructing two rectangles. So if we focus on the first, then we are looking at the coordinates of the vectors, of sorry, of the vertices of a specific rectangle. For example, only focusing on this first element for all of these uh, vectors. So if we have, for example, x1 and a1, oh, sorry, and j1, well, that's a coordinate x comma j of the rectangle. So one comma one is one of the, of the vertices. Then one comma three is the other vertex. 
And similarly, 2,1, the other vertex, and lastly, 2,3, the other vertex. So we do that. Uh, and in particular, uh, over here, we don't really need to, to pass the data uh, to wrap it with a ggplot uh, function. We can do that uh, outside, that is directly in the geom wrap, or even we can even not provide a data, but simply a mapping uh, in the sense that we define the specific coordinates of the vertices of a rectangle that we want to create. So not, the, not data, just yes, some rectangle. In this case, I do provide the data because I have these two rectangles. Uh, we simply define, right, for the young rect, the X mean, that is the X1 coordinate, the second X coordinate, the other Y coordinate, and lastly, the, well, the last Y coordinate. So, this part, over up to here, it will, it will generate us only these two rectangles over here. And we can see, for example, one of its vertices is 2,3. And we can mm -hmm. see over here, 2,3. And, and what I did find interesting is that for gen rect, uh, well, you don't really need a data argument because, for example, what we are doing over here is we define Again, the vertices, in this case, x as minus infinity, so we cover um, the whole, let's call it left range of the, of the plane. Then x max is infinity, so we are covering the whole x line. But now, with respect to the y line or the y axis, we do set some finite values. In particular, we're starting from the line y equals 2, but then we consider as the maximum of the of the y side or, or the height of our rectangle, infinity. So this is basically a rectangle that covers the whole x-axis, as you can see over here. It starts uh, well, vertically from the y equals two line, but then it expands in, uh, indefinitely to the top. And we're simply setting some transparency and a color for this specific rectangle. As we can see right here, it starts over here in the line y equal to, but it covers the whole field above. Now, and the useful application uh, in this article is basically to, to set some type of distinction from of a specific regions in your data. As they do over here, they perform the similar fashion of defining a, a specific rectangle no, not necessarily providing data. And then uh, a similar one, in this case, uh, well, we're using rectangles, but really they don't have to be uh, rectangles whose axes are parallel to the X axis and the Y axis. They, we can do something over or like this. And over here is the code. Well, there, there is a small difference that they use geom polygon, but we're also going to cover this specific one. So I will be sharing the link in the okay. chat. Uh, this one is interesting. Mm, now, well, this is a very short chapter. So I just finished with the exercise. But there was a little bit of theory that I didn't mention for these specific basic plot types. But I didn't mention it because it's going to be mentioned in the exercise as well. Over here, we're going to take a look at some different, some different type of plots. Um, how are they different uh, to the basic plot types that we have already covered? So for the exercise one, they ask us, uh, which are the geoms that we can use in order to create a scatter plot line chart, histogram, a bar chart, or a pie chart? Uh, well, we have already covered pretty much all of them, except for two, in particular the histogram, but we will, we will cover it later. Uh, I think it's in exercise two or three, so I will skip uh, mentioning, mentioning it. But this pie chart, we didn't cover it. 
And in particular, you can create it uh, combining the ion bar, uh, that one that generated rectangles. And, well, and coordinate, coordinate polar. So over here is a very basic example. So again, we have some categorical variable, variable some groups, male, female, and child, uh, and some values associated to, to such groups. So if we simply perform a geon bar of this, uh, well, we, we would get something like three rectangles, male has a height of 25, female has a five of 25, and the rectangle labeled child has a, a height of 50. But now to construct the pie chart, we well, we have to change a little bit the code in the sense that we don't provide an X argument. So it's like just an empty string. But for the Y argument, where we were going to be using this numeric quantity, mm -hmm. we will be using the field uh, argument. And that is going to separate our data via some categorical variable. In this case, it's just the group. And lastly, we use geon bar. I don't know why, but in this case, stat identity yeah. does work. I suppose that because we're providing a Y value. Yes. And now the last change is if you want the pie chart, then use, in particular, in its most basic form, uh, this thing over here. And we get the following. OK, Craig. Uh, so just as the, okay, thank you. Uh, just as a, a small comment, remember that uh, if we if we think about guidelines for visualizations, uh, well, pie charts are really not not recommended because it's um, at least for 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 many people, probably for most people, uh, it's not as clear to to get a a sense of uh, no, to get a quick sense of a difference between area or a difference between length. So if we would have simply showed a basic geom bar of this specific data, so as I mentioned, the, the basic rectangles, so it turns out that people do uh, understand such type of data more easily than if it was presented in this form. Because in the first one, it's really just height what we are uh, using to, to differentiate our data. Yes, the height of our rectangle is one dimension. However, over here, we're using the area of these specific sectors. And well, that's two dimensional. And for some reason, uh, many people have a harder time uh, comparing, oh, which area is bigger than the other and such and such. So that's something to keep in mind. Yes. Agreed, agreed. So in fact, if the same information was presented in a bar chart, it is much easier to understand because you can compare two bars which are parallel to each other uh, yes, rather than trying to understand the areas, right? So here, instead of 25, 25, it was, if, let's say if it was 23 and 28, then it would have been difficult to uh, differentiate between them. Yes, precisely. Yes, correct. Let's see a following exercise. Uh, over here, we're going to be looking at some similar type of yields to the ones that we have already been covered. So we have already covered, uh, but there are difference in this particular sense. For example, we start with geon path and geon polygon. I think we didn't go, we didn't see any of them. So let's look at this mm -hmm. example. Uh, we're going to be using three points, there is three x, y coordinates in the plane. And um, well, let me see something. Yeah, and well, this label really, it really doesn't matter because we're we are not going to see it in the in the actual graphics. So think of our data as just three vertices, sorry, three coordinates in the point, in the plane, sorry. And we're going to be mapping such data, these three points in the plane. Um, well, this is explain what it's doing. So I did the X and Y axis, uh, but really it does not matter for what we are trying to do. It's this what matters. So geon path and geon polygon. In a sense, they are similar 
almost similar to GM line, but what are the differences? In particular, GM line connects points from left to right. So that's why it makes it makes it such so useful. For example, when you want to see what is a graph of a function. Really, one should make the caveat that such function should be differentiable. If you want the geom line representation to be a valid representation of such function, differentiability is important. Uh, but now the difference that we were asked is that geom path and geom polygon, I'm oh, sorry, geom path is also going to create a, a sort of line. However, the points are going to be connected in order of appearance. And now for polygon, well, it's going to draw a polygon, but there is going to be a field path. So some area is going to be shaded. And over here we have the, the, diff, the, the comparison. We have this same graph that is simply uh, showing these three, three points in the plane. Mm -hmm. But to this basic graph, we're going to be adding some types of, of geoms for the line. You get this line, these three vertices, 1,4, 3,2, and 5,6. The line is created from left to right, as you can see. Now, for geom path, the, the line is different to this one over here. And why? Because what is the first argument of our data frame? Well, it's this one over here, the point 3,2. Mm -hmm. So we can see it's starting from here and to a second row, in particular this point 1,4. And finally to the other vertex. And um, as we can see for polygon, now, well, I went, I'm not sure if it's, if it draws it in the same fashion as line or as path, but at least in this particular case, uh, well, the outcome is the same because we really are, con are concerned with the, with the specific region that is defined by these points. Ah, so in that sense, it doesn't matter because the region is going to be defined as the, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, in Spanish is capsula convex, ah, it's convex, convex hole. Uh, but okay. but convex. the idea is that, yeah, sorry, sorry. But, but the idea is that uh, it doesn't matter if it's lying or path, really, the outcome will be the same. It's just another type of mathematical operation. So we get this field shape or a shaded region. And now to finish up, we will take a look at the last exercise. So as we mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have covered some basic plot types. And many of them are used in order to con to construct more complex ones. Uh, we have we have seen the use of this geom smooth function. Uh, well, as you can see over here, it's used to feed uh, a smooth version of the data. Uh, and then maybe just let's take a look at the graph. We get this shaded region and some particular line. Okay, so then what low-level geoms, that is, for example, some of the basic plot types that we have, been, that we have covered, what low-level geoms are used to draw this particular geom, this more complex one? And well, this, this answer was in the, in the notes of the previous cohort, and the answer was geom path, geom area, and geom point. As you can see over here. Now, for another type of more complex geom, like geom box plot, which low-level geoms are used to draw it? Well, uh, well, we 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 already know what a box plot is. So let's just look at the answer. As we can see, we're using lines, uh, rectangles for this box that contains fifty percent of the data, and also some points for the possible outliers. And in that, in that sense, uh, the basic geoms are red for this rectangle. 
geom line for well for this line and geom point as I said for the possible outliers. So just to finish up, what which are the low level geoms that are used in order to draw the geom violin? Well, this is how the geom violin function what 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 the geom violin function produces. So it's like a mirrored version of the of the density of your data, in this case per group. Um, what it's it's being used for the geom violin to work is geom area. Okay? And that's why I said that it seems that you can also fill the space defined by geom area with respect to the x-axis, not only the y-axis, as we saw in the other example, but also geom path. Probably to define this uh, this core of, of the density, well, the empirical density of your data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's it. It's a, it was a very short chapter. Really. Are there hey, any uh, questions or comments? Uh, thanks. Uh, th thank you, Lucio. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, this was a pretty short chapter. So, uh, Maybe we can uh, wrap this up uh, sooner. Um, uh, but so one point on, so in, in this chapter, uh, we are only two left. So I'll follow up with uh, Olu, Afemi and uh, others and, and see if, they are, if they'll be able to make it to the next one. Uh, but for the next one, if you look at uh, the list, right? Uh, collective jobs, which is on 27th. In fact, let, can I share my screen? Uh, yes, sorry, sorry. Okay. So, so if I, you can see my screen, right? Uh, yeah, it's a Google Calendar. Yeah, yeah. So, in uh, no, it's a, okay, it's a, can you see the spreadsheet? Oh, the yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. Volunteers. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, for the next one, it's uh, on 27th April. I'll uh, I'll do collective jobs, right? And then for the statistical summaries, would uh, do, would you want to nominate yourself, or should I take this up? Uh, I think I can. Yeah, maybe you can consider me over there. And if okay. something happens near that date, uh, I will let you know. But I think it's okay. Okay, okay. So for now, I'll put your name, but just in, in case you are not able to uh, fin uh, make it, then maybe even if you let me know by next week, right? When we meet again next week, uh, then I'll, I can start preparing for this one as well. Uh, yeah. If it doesn't work for you. Yeah. Um, cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention possibly a, a recommendation for, for anyone trying to to prepare notes of a chapter. For example, when you presented the chapter, uh, I mean, you were working with the, with the forked book down a uh, project from the previous cohort, right? Yes. And you, did you render the whole book? Yes. Uh, okay. So I, I wanted to share something because mm -hmm. when I forked the, the book project that is, this whole collection of files for this book. Well, a day for me, it didn't work to to render the whole book because it was too to perform a lot of time, right? Yeah. yeah, yes, it was too much time. But um, well, a basic fix, fix for that for anyone that is going to present, you can modify the book down in YAML file, uh, so that you can um. Uh, Define which are the R markdown files that are going to be rendered for the book. So that is what I added over here. So say if you're going to be presenting, let's see, maybe this fourth chapter, then you just simply copy the name of the chapter that you're going to, well, the name of the file of the chapter that you're going to present. And over here in this section, you only need, well, the index RMD and then the well this the name of the file that you're of the chapter that you're going to present so it should be something like over here only this and then only 
this one over here. In this case, I, I have three three items. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, because I wanted to have three, but really you only need two. And in that case, once you render the book, uh, it does do it pretty quickly. It's only rendering two files. Okay, great, great. So that will speed up your uh, rendering a lot, right? Uh... Yes, quite, quite a lot. Okay. Okay, great, ah. great. That's that's a great tip. Yeah. Yes, but only that's only when one is creating the notes. When you are when you have already finished your notes and such, uh, remove this so that when the book uh, is getting rendered for the online version, that in that case all chapters are considered. S sorry, when when? So when you have already finished your notes uh -huh. and you are going to push to GitHub, uh, mm -hmm. remove this part. So that the online version of the book does render the whole chapters, but not only the one you were working on. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct. Okay. So that was it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you, Lucio. Uh, we'll meet next week. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.